Okay, so we're up to uh, the Mida number four, which we began talking about uh, yesterday. Lishayris Nachalasai, which literally means Hashem is merciful. Those are the words before that. Lishayris Nachalasai, to the remnant of his inheritance. And again, uh, which of the Yud Gimel Midos of Moshe is this corresponding to? So since this is number four, and uh, the cheshpin of the Mekubalim is that the first mida is not Hashem Hashem, but Kale. So Kale, Rachum, Chanun, this corresponds to Erech. Remember, they actually split Erech Apayim. This corresponds to Erech. And Erech is the mida of patience, that God is long-suffering. And now, again, I, I actually I just want to mention, again, a, di a difficult problem in the time of Ira generally. <clears throat> the Timer Devaira is not a commentary on the Yud Gimel Midas of Misha. The Timer Devaira is a commentary on the Yud Gimel Midas of Micha. It's also the case that the Yud Gimel Midas of Misha, Micha are supposed to correspond to the Yud Gimel Midas of Misha, but the problem is the Timer Devaira never shows us what that correspondence is. Okay, so. He will not say directly, he will explain Lishayris Nachalasai, but he will not say directly how it connects to the Mida of Erech. We have to, I'm assuming that it's legitimate to make that connection because after all, <coughs> the Midas do correspond, but we sometimes will have to speculate. So let's first see what the Torah Devar says about the Mida of, of in Micha, and then we'll see how you would uh, connect it to the Mida of Moshe Rabbeinu. So She'eris Nachalasa, as I said yesterday, the Chiddush of the Timur Devaira is that She'eris is not understood as remnant or remainder, but She'eris is understood as She'er Basar, which means Korva. We are related. We are family. And I'll read the, the line here. Hinei HaKadosh Baruch Misnaheg Im Yisrael B'derech Hashem acts with Bnei Yisrael in the following way. Omer, he says, Kav Yochel, Ma esel Yisrael, what can I do to the Jewish people? Vehem Krovai, they are my relatives. She'er basar li imahem. It's as if we are related by flesh. Now obviously the word basar is not to be taken literally as connected to God. But God says, they are my mishpacha. Shehem bas zug la kadesh baruchu. So bas zug means a spouse. We are treated as the spouse of God. And in addition, kori la biti achaisi imi kidapir shuzal in shira shirim rabba. So the Torah of virus says we have no fewer than four relationships with HaKadosh Baruch We are HaKadosh Baruch Hu's spouse. So his relationship to us is like a husband who loves his wife. Now that is a very, very common imagery. And uh, that is what uh, Shira Shirim is based on. Uh, the notion that we are Hashem's wife, so to speak, and he loves us like a, like a husband. Um, that's why in some ways we uh, are kind of bisexual. When it comes to our connection to God, we are the feminine and God is the masculine. But then we also describe our marriage to Shabbos, where Shabbos is the feminine and we are the masculine. So, okay, I'm going to make a bad joke about gay pride. I will not, will not make the bad joke. <laughs> okay, but uh, there's kind of a transition of both of, those, of both of those things. And that is why throughout the Nevi'im, when the Jewish people worship Avedah Zorah, the imagery that is always used is the unfaithful wife who commits adultery against her husband. That's a very, very common image throughout the Nevi'im. And indeed, uh, Chazal say that that is why Moshe Rabbeinu, when he came down and he saw the Jewish people worshiping the Egel, so what did he do? He ground up the Egel, he mixed it with water, and he made them drink it. That's exactly the ritual of the Sota, the unfaithful wife. So the notion that Hashem is the husband and we are the wife, 
is one aspect of our relationship, right? We are husband and wife. But in addition, we are called Biti. Hashem calls us his daughter. Okay, we'll talk about what that means. There's another Pasuk where Hashem calls us his sister. Okay, and then there's a third Pasuk, and this is the most amazing, in which he calls us his mother. Now that already is a little bit strange. Uh, so we have God as spouse, God as parent, although it's interesting, he only brings the Medrash that we are God's daughter. Of course, we also know that we're also called God's sons as well. Banim. Okay, but either way, we'll call it parent. Right? So our relationship to Hashem is multifaceted. Hashem is spouse. Hashem is parent. Hashem is sibling. Hashem is child. Now, of all of them, the last one is the most uh, shocking, in a way. But the general idea is that every aspect of these relationships has a unique type of love and connection. Your connection to your wife is not the same as your connection to your parents, and your connection to your parents is not the same as the connection to your siblings. And the connection to your children is not the, or to your, uh, is not the same as your connection in the other way. So Hashem is connected to us in a composite of all of these different types of relationships. Which means to say every facet of a loving relationship is part of an infinity of love. And God's love is infinite, so it encompasses every single facet of that relationship. Now, the notion of spouse, the notion of child, and even the notion of sibling can be a little bit comprehensible to us. Uh, a child, of course, receives everything from the parent. An infant, for example, is helpless. Uh, a sibling, there's more of a relationship of equality. So again, um, the Svarim tell us that when we left Mitzrayim and we didn't have mitzvos and we were on the 49th level of Tuma, we were like a baby being dragged out of the mud. By the time Shavuos comes around, we worked in ourselves and we become kind of a sibling with God. God, you know, we give God mitzvos, he gives us life and the like. But what is this last thing? How can you describe Hashem as your child? Meaning, meaning Hashem calls us his mother. We are the mother of God. It sounds suspiciously a little bit like some other religion, the mother of God. So what does that mean? And by the way, uh, if Christianity uses those terms as the way they distort them, they got them from chazals like this, meaning to say they took these phrases and they used them in their particular ways, which are uh, you know, cro crooked and, and incorrect. But this is where such an idea comes, that God has a mother. So the simple pshat of God as a mother is really explained by the Nefesh HaChaim. In the Nefesh HaChaim, <coughs> he talks about the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu's only desire is to give, to bless, to be mashpia, his tov. But Hashem made a universe where all of that tov is locked up until we release it by our Torah, by our mitzvahs, by our Avaida. Hashem, so to speak, is locked within himself. Now, of course, he didn't have to. It's not like a weakness. People say, oh, that means God is not infinite. No, God could have willed it the other way. So in a sense, it's not a limitation on God. That's a very important point. It's not a weakness or a deficiency on the part of God. But it is, you might call, a self-imposed limitation. God willed that he kind of be paralyzed until we open him up. And that's the Nefesh Chaim. that's the whole idea, that when you do Taira and Mitzvos, it's not just, you know, you did a good thing and you're gonna be rewarded. You actually affect the whole structure of the universe. Now obviously as one person, maybe I only affect it a little bit, but enough people, they affect the whole structure of the universe. So in that way, 
we can be called the parent of God because just as an infant is helpless without the aid of the parent, so too, and again, I, I, I want to underscore this, by virtue of Hashem's self-imposed limitation, self-imposed limitation, not an inherent weakness, God is helpless until we release him. In fact, the Nefesh Chaim says, this is the meaning of the Pasuk in Tehillim that we say every day in davening. Tanu owes lay like him. Give strength to God. What does it mean, give strength to God? Yeah, we give strength to God because we enable God to do all that he wants to do in the world, and that is to be mative. So in that sense, we are like the parents because we are giving our child, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in this uh, very um, strong uh, mashal, we are giving God the koach to do things that he otherwise would not be able to do. So the Ramak is not really explaining these points. I mean, the Ramak is bringing all of this in just for a more general point, that we see we are related to Hashem in so many ways. We are his spouse, we are his child, we are his sibling, we are his parent. Now, any one of those relationships is a very strong relationship of love, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu encapsulates all of those relationships put together. Yeah. Is there any sense that Hashem gets like, locked back up? Because if we are just constantly doing mitzvahs, wouldn't there be a, just a constant linear increase in the Shem's screen in the world? Like, why would we ever have a decrease in Hashem's presence? Well, because, uh, once again, uh, the, the Averus of the world block, uh, block the Shefa. I mean, there needs to be a divine influence coming into the world every the second. So right. So there's like pipeline. Again, I mean, obviously this is simplistic and not literal, but, but the Kabbalists describe it as pipelines, so to speak. You open the pipe, you close the pipe. Tsinar. Tsinar is the word that's actually used. Uh, you close the pipe, you open the pipe. Uh, some pipes are open here and not there. Uh, all of it depends. In fact, uh, it's interesting that uh, the Nefesh Chaim says what you would have thought is a Hasidish of words, but the Nefesh Chaim says it. He says, Da ma la mimcha. Pirkei Avo says that one of the things that will keep you from sin is know what is above you. Da ma la mimcha. Know about what is above you, meaning think of Hashem. So he reads it this way. This is the Chap. Da ma la mala, kama. Know that everything above, mimcha, is from you. That's the translation. You, all of us, affect what happens up above there. In fact, this is one of the great teachings of Kabbalah, really. I mean, it may be implicit in Chazal's that, that mitzvos are not just about you. It's not just about the guy that does it. See, we tend, as we're growing up, you know, the simple idea of mitzvahs is, you know, God gave us commandments, and therefore if I do them, I'm in a good shape, and if I don't do them, I may be in a bad shape. In other words, it was focused on me. But Kabbalah brought a different perspective to it, that this deals with global, universal tikkun, rectification, or universal destruction. Your mitzvahs are not just about you. They are about affecting the whole Bria Sa'olam. I don't, I don't want to, I keep on getting drag, dragged into this. I don't, it's my own fault because I drag myself into it. But, you know, I'm sure everybody has heard, and I mentioned it in Q&As a few times, uh, Rabbi Manus Friedman's famous, infamous statement, God needs you, and, you know, is he Yanapi Chorus, or is he saying uh, something correct? You know, people love to debate this and discuss this, and I'm not interested in discussing it and him and, and the like. But the notion that God needs you could be understood in different ways. And certainly, Hashem has no defect. Hashem has no chisaran. Hashem has no deficiency or weakness in the sense that he needs us. That's true. But God's will is that he needs us to do certain things. In other words, because think about this logically. Hashem made the world or the universe for a purpose. I think that's axiomatic. We're not going to say Hashem made the universe for no reason at all. Hashem made the universe for a purpose. Now, if he has a purpose, 
That means without creating the universe, that purpose wouldn't be realized. That's just what the words mean. Hashem has a purpose in this universe. So in that sense, he needs us to do the thing that is the purpose for which he created the universe. So, I mean, in a way, it's not, it's not even a controversial statement in that sense, because it, 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 it flows automatically from the statement that God had a purpose in mind. So, in a sense, the purpose is, now we don't know why Hashem made it this way, he could have made it another way. But he made it this way, that all of the goodness that comes into the world comes from us, and we are Balei Bechira, so we can tie God's hands. Because, it, in other words, God is, is Meshubba to us, because we have Bechira. Now, he didn't have to give us Bechira either. So, there's no limitation on God. That, that's where I think people are making a mistake here. But these are the choices Hashem made for reasons that may be inscrutable on an ultimate level. Yeah. Um, if we're saying that it's God's will that, um, that he be held back by certain, uh, by certain things, by our Bechira, or by the, by the purpose of creation, then aren't we saying that God himself is held, like, has these holding us back, because he, he and the will are, are the same thing, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, but, but once again, uh, Hashem is the ultimate Baal Bechira. Mm -hmm. so, so, if Hashem chooses to lock himself up, that is not a deficiency, that is a choice. Right? I choose right, to not exercise my powers under certain conditions. So, de facto, that means I've put myself at your mercy, but that's my choice. My choice was to put myself at your mercy. So that's not a deficiency. See, that's the critical thing, is when people hear the phrase, God needs, they automatically think of weakness, deficiency, chisaran. But again, I don't think that has to follow. God decides what it is he wants to accomplish uh, in, in the world. But as I say, so, so the first point here is that Hashem's relationship to us is one of korva. We are relatives in all of these different ways. Spouse, sibling, child, and even, even parent in the Nefesh HaChayim's explanation. And then he brings a Pasuk in Tehillim that we also recite every day. Uh, Livnei Yisrael Am Kirovo. The nation that is close to him, but krovo can also mean, and it's the same word really, the nation that is related to him. We are treated like a korov. And that is the meaning, this is the Ramak Chiddush, that she'eris is lashain she'er basar, which means a relative. V'sof sof, heim nachaloso, and that's why we are God's inheritance. And therefore, uma lemor, imanishem, hareya ke'eve lai. We're related. So if I punish them, it's like I'm hurting myself because we're connected. Now, let me just point out the following idea. And you have to pay attention as you look at the Torah Devorah. Some of the Midos are describing Rachamim after we do tshuva. And some of the Midos are describing the Rachamim before we do Tshuva. This is actually describing the Rachamim before Tshuva. And this is why I would suggest, although the Ramak does not address it, this is why it is connected to the Midah of Erech. Because Erech Apayim, whether you count Erech Apayim as one or just Erech, is the long-suffering nature of God who waits for you to do Tshuva and does not punish you. So what the Ramak is saying is the mida of patience before we do tshuva stems from the fact that the, the, the patience a father has for a son or a husband has for a wife or even a brother, a sibling, etc. Uh, is much greater than it might be for, for an outsider. Now, here I just want to also make, uh, make an interesting point that what the Ramak is assuming as a Dover Pashat, a basic feature of human psychology, uh, may not resonate uh, with the modern reader that much. I mean, the Ramak is assuming, oh, 
you hurt me and all sorts of things. But you're family, so of course I'm not going to be angry at you. Of course I'm not going to hurt you. Of course I'm not going to punish you because you're family. Huh. Is that the way we think? <laughs> very, very often, it's kind of the opposite almost, you know. Children don't talk to their parents. Parents don't talk to their children. Husbands and wives get estranged all the time. And brothers, siblings certainly get I mean, again, it's, it's a real Rachmanis. But estrangement of siblings is something you come across every day. Oh, I haven't talked to my brother for 20 years, you know, for, for whatever reason. So it's interesting that we see what a Yerida Sadoras was, that essentially what the Ramak is saying is, it is instinctual, it is natural that if you're family, I have a strong connection. I will tell you that I, I do, I, I, we still see this today. I'll give you, <laughs> I, should, I shouldn't give these examples, but I'll, I'll give the example. Um, you know, Brisk, the Chash of the Yeshivas of Brisk, are, uh, you know, the epitome of learning, great analytical learning. Uh, the children, the grandchildren of the Briskerov continue this. And you know that Brisk also has very, very strong opinions about a whole bunch of things. They're very anti-Zionism. They're, they're, they're against a lot of things because they consider them not to be Das Torah and not to be right, etc. Okay. So as you know, there are two branches of Brisk. There's Eretz Yisrael Brisk, which has, itself has several branches. And then there's American Brisk. Now this stems from the fact that Rav Chaim Soloveitchik had two sons. He had, more, he had three sons, but he had two sons who became very prominent. Gedolim. The older son was the Brisker Rav, the last Rav of Brisk, Rav Yitzhak Zev Soloveitchik, who was in the Warsaw Ghetto during the Holocaust, lost his, his Rebetzin, but came to Eretz Yisrael, and the Brisker Rav was regarded as kind of the Gadol Hador. The Brisker Rav died in 1960. And the Brisker Rav was, as they say, the, the Eretz Yisrael Briskers are the anti-Zionists. And the Brisker Rav was very much against Zionism, very much against any participation in the Medina. Uh, it's kind of an aspect of the Tureh Kart, although it's not exactly the same. Right, so that was the Briskarov. And uh, the children and grandchildren have that Yerusha. They don't take any money. To their credit, to their credit, they are very consistent uh, anti-Zionists. There are anti-Zionists, which, you know, kind of cheat, meaning, uh, I'm against the Medina, but I'll take the check. <laughs> Brisk, to its very great credit, says, you know, we don't believe in Medina. We don't take any money from the Medina even if it's being offered for yeshivas, because we believe that once we take money, we're subject to control. We want our independence. So you may disagree with the shita, but uh, I think you have to admire the honesty and consistency of that shita. Now, the other son of Rav Chaim Soloveitchik was Rav Moshe Soloveitchik. Now, Rav Moshe Soloveitchik, it's hard to know the evolution exactly, but uh, he kind of became a supporter of, of, of some Zionist efforts. Uh, he eventually came to New York. He became a Rosh Hashiva at YU in the early years of YU. And when Rav Moshe Soloveitchik died, he was succeeded by his son, who became uh, what you might call the leader of more modern orthodoxy, but he was a great, great Talmud Chacham, Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, the famous Rav Joseph Soloveitchik was the son of Rav Moshe Soloveitchik, uh, and therefore the nephew of the Brisker Rav, the grandson of Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, the great-grandson of the Beis Halevi. In fact, the Beis Halevi's name was Yosef Tov, and um, Rav Yosef Tov was named after his great-grandfather. Uh, now, both Rav Moshe Soloveitchik and later Rav Yosef Tov Soloveitchik became very, very identified as religious Zionists, etc. So that's the old joke that uh, the, those who don't live in Eretz Israel are the Zionists, and the briskers who live in Eretz Israel are the anti-Zionists. So suffice it to say that although both branches are learned and choshev v'tomidei chachamim, but their hashkafas are very, very, very different, very different on secular studies as well. I mean, the Soloveitchiks uh, of YU, you know, believed in Torah Umada, Torah and Derech whatever you want to call it, I don't want to get into the subtleties, but that's also a very big difference, right? Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik had a PhD in philosophy from the University of Berlin. So, the briskers here often go on, you know, tirades against this and that and that and that, and, 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 they'll, and they'll mention names, they'll mention, oh, this rabbi here, you know, had a meeting with uh, the prime minister, and how could he do that? 
So somebody asked him, he says, hey, you know, your uh, cousin in New York, you know, did this all, all the time. Like, how come you never say anything? About you mention names of this person or that person because it's a mitzvah to be far same people who are making mistakes. So how come you never talk about your cousin in New York? So he said, he says, that's family. I don't talk negative about family. <laughs> now, in a way, that's inconsistent because essentially he's giving family a free pass for negative hashkafas, again, according to what he holds, is negative hashkafas, but no one else gets a free pass, right? Uh, you know, I would get criticized. I know Rosh Hashivas will get criticized, you know, if they're too Zionistic. Elamai, so what do you see? Okay, <laughs> I shouldn't have gone in this direction, but what you see is that there is a certain hashivas that you have for mishpacha. Now, this is interesting. Uh, some of you might have heard of uh, Peter Singer. Um, I think he's still alive. Uh, I don't know how old he is. Peter Singer, a famous guy, Jew, happens to be Jewish, uh, professor at Princeton, but he's uh, part of, what do they call the Advanced Center for Advanced Studies, means he doesn't have to teach. Einstein was there. There's like a center. Princeton is rich enough that they can pay professors uh, a lot of money, and they don't even have teaching responsibilities. They just sit and think and write and machadesh, etc. Einstein was like that, and Peter Singer was also, is also one of the people who just, he just thinks and writes. A very brilliant philosopher, and Peter Singer was the inventor, actually, of the animal rights movement. He was the founder of PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of, of Animals, and he's very, very well known, a uh, very famous ethicist philosophy of ethic, ethical behavior. And he has a lot of chidushim that some people think are crazy. Uh, one of his chidushim is, he says, there is no moral justification to treat your children better than any other human being. He says, we have a moral obligation to help humanity. Where do you get that from? Whatever it is. But he says, who says your kids? If you happen to be, have a, you have a good paying job. What gives you the right to live more comfortable than people who are starving in Africa? And what gives you the right to give your kids good clothes if people in Africa, let's say, are in rags? So Peter Singer basically said, you're mechoyev to kind of distribute all of your income beyond subsistence levels meaning everybody should live, whatever income distribution would be, uh, because he says there is no moral reason to prefer your family over other people. Now, you may, the first question that will, will occur to you is, well, how does he live? Did he live that way? So the answer is uh, not quite. He was Moscow. He couldn't be 100%, but he did. Actually, he gave very high percentages of his money to charity. And he lived a relatively simple life. So he says, he says he tries. He says he actually tries to live by that standard. So he goes even further. He says, and this is where animal liberation turns crazy. He says, and you know, who says humans are any better than animals? He even said, at a certain stage of development, an animal might be, have more intelligence than a human being. He says, a, a six-year-old dog is more intelligent than a six-month-old baby. So, if the baby is drowning and the dog is drowning, uh, why should you save the baby over the dog? Right. So he has he, he has he has very extreme views in a lot of lot of ways. Now it's interesting that he's from Australia originally, and his mother was a prominent attorney in Australia, and as she got older, she got dementia. So he paid a lot of money to get her into the best, like, nursing facility in Australia. So somebody asked him, why are you wasting your money on people who are senile? I mean, put your money to work for people who are productive and can live a long time. So he said, he said, when it's your mother, it's hard to be philosophical. <laughs> now, that itself is a very interesting point, and I think it's going to tie into the term of virus, actually. So here's the question I want to ask you. I think it's Pushit that Singer's argument that animals and people are the same, no, that's obviously, we don't accept that. But what's the idea about favoring your children? I mean, after all, uh, it says, you have, to, you have to love every Jew. Let's talk about Jews. Just to put it, put, let's put aside non-Jews for, for a moment. I got to love every Jew. I have to love every Jew like myself. If that's true, 
then maybe Peter Singer is right, at least on that first point, that why should I love my children more than I love you? You're made in the image of God. I'm made in the image of God. My kids are made in the image of God. Like, what, what, where do my kids get some claim? Why should I love my wife more? In other words, the question is, is the particularization of love that we have is that what the Torah wants? Or does the Torah want there to be a general love for everybody? Now, I will say, it is actually brought down. I don't want to mention the name of the Gadol right now. Uh, that there was a certain Gadol who had reached such a level of Avas Yisrael that there was no difference between the way he related to his children and the way he related to everybody else. There was no difference because his Avas Yisrael was so high. But you know, I will tell you this, I also know that that particular Gadol had children who went off the derech. Now, I'm not suggesting there's a cause and effect, but maybe there's a cause and effect. Something to think about. If my kids do not feel that their Abba cares about them more than other people, what effect does that have on the kids? Again, something you think about. Yeah, but he loves me so much. Yeah, he loves you so much, like he loves everybody else. Is that enough for a child? Is it enough for a child to feel he loves me just like he loves the other six billion people on earth? It may not work as a parent, you see? So here is, I think, the profundity of, and Peter Singer's a smart guy, so I think he got the profundity. When Peter Singer answered, it's hard to be philosophical when it's your mother, he's actually acknowledging that God put into human nature the need to have particularistic attachments. And from the particularistic love you have, it then branches out. But you can't just have this universal love unless it's concretized in particularized relationships. Remember the, uh, not that I'm very, very far from an expert, uh, but uh, some of you might know, I don't even know the tune, but I, I, I read a book about this, uh, John Lennon and the Jews, a very excellent, very excellent book, by the way. And it, this was a commentary, an extended commentary on his song, I think it was called Imagine. Uh, again, I, I don't even, uh, I've never heard the song, but imagine is kind of the message. Imagine what the world would be like, you know, if we didn't have separate religions and we didn't have separate nations and we just loved everybody. And the thesis of the book, which was actually a powerful thesis, was that love has to start in the particular and concrete before it could spread to the universal. Okay? In fact, sometimes movements like communism, like Pol Pot, are kind of universal love and wind up killing millions of people because of the universal ideal as opposed to caring about the guy that's next to you. So, the refutation, the pircha to Peter Singer is that his philosophy of life is against the nature that God implanted within us. And the fact that we have that nature is a proof that this is something we want. And indeed, you understand, if Hashem describes us as his children, his spouse, his sibling, his mother, that means there is something special. I mean, there is something special about that. Because if you're going to tell me, hey, there's nothing special about my wife or my brother because I love everybody. Then why is Hashem saying, you're my brother or you're my sister? The very fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu describes his relationship with us in terms of korva means there is such a thing as korva. You see, otherwise, what's the point? Why would God even utilize those categories? unless those categories are in, intentionally and intrinsically meaningful categories. Okay, so I think that essentially uh, what is being discussed here, at least indirectly, is a refutation of Peter Singer, 
in the sense that we need, there is something special about familial love. And that is why you will find among Gedolim, not just the brisker story I shared you with, but even, even among other Gedolim who are so involved in all of Klal Yisrael, that they will have a special involvement in their own families. That they're my family, what can I do? Now the Timer Devira says that this is the source of God's patience. That's the connection to Erech. The source of God's patience is, what can I do? It's my family. How can I hurt them, right, etc. And the, of course the corresponding meter that we imitate uh, is that I look at every Jew as my family and therefore I forgive, I don't take offense. And then he'll go Kabbalistically, he'll then go into uh, another notion, which is really a side notion, but a very important one, of the intermingling of souls. That it's not just, you're my family, but part of my spiritual neshama is within you, and part of your spiritual neshama is within me. So we're literally intermingled, and therefore we're kind of connected that way. Yeah. So, if Hashem's patience comes from the fact that we're family, uh, is that just for for the Jews as opposed to Goyim? And on top of it, like Jews have obviously, it's notorious that we've gone through a lot of like Orban, like a lot more so than a lot of other cultures. Like we have pogroms and the Holocaust, yeah. you know, so how, how do you reconcile that idea? So, so the truth is, uh, with respect to the second question, although it's going to be hard to answer this in specific tragedies, but the Chumash itself gives you the mafteach to that by saying, as a parent disciplines a child, so too God disciplines you. Now, again, I understand that you would think the Holocaust is excessive discipline, but, but, but putting that issue aside, the notion is that precisely because we're family, Hashem takes more involvement in us, meaning uh, if my next door neighbor's kid is not behaving, I'm not going to necessarily discipline him. If my own child is misbehaving, I've got to take some initiative. So precisely because of our korva, Hashem is more, more involved. Now, vis-a-vis -vis non-Jews, it's a complicated issue indeed. Uh, keep in mind that uh, only the Jewish people, all, all people are made in the image of God. Non-Jews are B'Tselem Elohim, for sure. But the Jewish people are called the children of God. So that's a unique title. Uh, for the children and the other appellations as, as well. So the non-Jew is an Eved Hashem. We are both Avadim, but we are also Banim. So because of this, we have that special Midah of She'eris Nachalasai. Okay, so uh, we'll continue this. So, so tomorrow we'll, we'll look at this other idea, which is a corollary idea of the intermingling of all of the Nishamos of Am Yisrael. Each of us is a composite of everybody else. So each one of us has every part of each other within us in addition to our own particular essence.